Hello everyone, Luke Groman, FFTT. Hope everybody had a great weekend. I know here in Ohio it was absolutely beautiful. I just got done watching uh, the LA Chargers and the referees defeat the Cleveland Browns with uh, a couple of very uh, poor pass interference calls that helped the Chargers and didn't help us. So at any rate, what are you going to do? Still very competitive and entertaining game. So with that, I am going to jump into this week's comments or this week's discussion. First question is from SC. Uh, question for you. Can you expand on your math behind the idea that the U.S. government cannot afford to increase interest rates? Interest expense is a pretty small line item in the budget, and they're paying almost around 2% already. So I think it's important to just highlight that when I say interest expense, what we're using is our true, what we call true interest expense. And when we say true interest expense, that is not just the interest expense. We don't look at net interest. We look at gross interest. Uh, but we also look at entitlement pay goes. In other words, the pay as you go portion of entitlements. And so uh, that is effectively the interest expense uh, on an annualized basis that you need to float the 100 trillion plus in entitlements. So basically entitlement pay as you go is plus treasury spending per the quarterly treasury borrowing advisory committee report. Treasury spending used to be just gross, in gross interest expense. Now it is uh, stimulus as well, uh, which are just entitlements effectively to keep GDP growing growing uh, because uh, uh, it needs to keep growing. So uh, the punchline is that true interest expense, entitlement pay goes plus treasury spending is 111% of U.S. GDP. Uh, a rise in interest rates would likely send U.S. interest expense up uh, modestly. I don't think that's the real lever in the problem. The real lever is that a rise in interest rates will cause tax receipts to fall pretty notably. Um, we've seen this uh, before. And so your 111% uh, true interest expense relative to tax receipts goes to 115% or 120%. And at that point, either the U.S. government starts cutting spending uh, to get those numbers back below tax receipts, or else uh, the Fed steps in and prints the difference. And the challenge with the U.S. government cutting is the U.S. government is now 30% of GDP. The U.S. government starts cutting that amount of GDP in a slowdown, uh, you're going to touch off uh, a debt deflation spiral. You really cannot have a recession uh, as a policy option with debt to GDP at 125%. So that's, I think, really important, uh, a really important delineation uh, that to understand, to really treat the entitlement pay goes as interest expense. Uh, from GK, hi Luke, if we're on our way to defaulting on our debt through either inflation or deflation, have you yet considered one day moving your assets out of the U.S.? before the government imposes capital controls and devalues or steals from its citizens, as has been the case throughout history? Uh, the short answer is no. Uh, I will say, to be clear, I do not think uh, the United States will nominally default on treasuries or entitlements, uh, the deflationary outcome. Uh, I, I think there's zero chance of, that ha of the U.S. defaulting. And, and if that's the case, I think it will likely be via inflation reducing debt to GDP. And what that looks like is inflation running 10 to 15 percent, 20 percent for several years in a row, while the Fed caps interest rates at, say, 2 percent. Uh, bondholders get screwed to the tune of uh, 8 to 20, eight to 15 percent per year for uh, several years in a row. Uh, I do not, I, I, and now to answer the question, uh, I am not considering moving my assets out of the country. Uh, in my opinion, many countries are in a similar situation. Uh, and the situation uh, globally is uh, quite frankly so bad that uh, the U.S. may be uh, the best, safest place in terms of rule of law. And I think critically, we have natural resources at the right price. Those prices are much higher in all likelihood than, than we're seeing today for a lot of these different resources and commodities. But there are a lot of other places around the world that won't have them at any price, uh, in, in quite possibly. So uh, within the U.S., however, I continue to definitely avoid bonds. Uh, I continue to move assets uh, into, um, as, uh, as, as we have cash come in, I continue to de deploy that cash into assets a diversified assets by uh, diversified by both politically acceptable inflation hedges and politically unacceptable inflation hedges. Um, uh, politically acceptable are equities and real estate. Politically unacceptable are gold and Bitcoin. So um, I also think that within the U.S., one must start to consider certain issues one has not had to consider for a very long time. Uh, things like uh, how what is what is the carrying capacity of your state if you're living in a desert. Uh, and we're seeing supply chains break down. Um, 
I, I think these are things we may start to need to think about. I think if we're t- paying attention to what's happening in Europe, in China, in the U.S., uh, you don't want to be in a desert with 40 million other people uh, and insufficient uh, in, 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 in-state in food, water, energy resources. And the reality is, is that describes probably 100 to 150 million people in the U.S. where they live. So... Um, I do think that's start something you may need to start thinking about. I think uh, certain elements of politics, without getting into politics, certain areas um, may be better politically or tax friendly than others. That's something else you need to consider. But the answer is no. I'm not considering moving my assets out of the U.S. I think for a number of reasons, um, you know, failing something, getting much worse. Um, uh, there's a lot of natural resources, natural barriers the U.S. has that a lot of other places don't. Uh, from Anon, most historical inflation analysis is based on individual or a few countries facing inflation. Current case is more of the developed countries facing inflation along with globalism. Doesn't this environment favor the dollar? Uh, I think it's the first global sovereign debt bubble bursting in the in, in 100 years that's bursting. And I think that's we need to uh, understand that. And the last time we had a global sovereign debt bubble burst was in the immediate aftermath of World War One. In that instance, all six global industrial powers um, defaulted uh, or devalued their currencies significantly to reduce their debt loads. Um, uh, it felt like a default, I'm sure, to the sovereign bondholders. Um, U.S. Uh, U.S. Uh, devalued last, um, and I think this is an important um, highlight. So the last time we were in a global sovereign debt bubble. Uh, UK was the global reserve currency. Um, two of the six industrial powers hyperinflated their currencies to zero, the, the, the Germans and the Russians. Uh, the French def- devalued their currency two or three different times very dramatically. Uh, the UK, uh, the global reserve currency, devalued um, uh, in 1931 quite significantly, I think 65% against gold. And then the dollar went last in 33. Uh, the point is, is that... Um, I think from a rule of law perspective, a natural resource perspective, yes, I think the U.S. looks probably the most attractive. Uh, From a situation where uh, now versus then where the post-$71 system required us to run deficits and everyone else to effectively buy our debt to finance those deficits, everyone else either doesn't want to or does not have the capital or the balance sheet to finance our deficits. So... This is turning into a contest of who's running the biggest deficits who and, and whose central bank will print the most, uh, the fastest. And the U.S. is going to run the biggest deficits because by virtue of the system we, we, we are, are, are coming to an end with, the post-$71 system. So the U.S. has had to run the biggest deficits to supply the dollars to the world, except the rest of the world's not buying our treasuries anymore. So the Fed's going to have to print the most to buy the most debt relative to other areas. So... I'm not convinced that the dollar is going to be the best currency. I think ultimately it will be the worst currency, um, given that the Fed is going to have to finance the most amount of deficits relative to anybody else. Uh, With that said, like I said before, I think the U.S. will arguably be the best place for capital, but I don't think that necessarily means it's going to be good for the dollar uh, over the course of this cycle. Uh, Let's see. Next question is, uh, from FC, with reference to Jason Lowry's post about a captive audience uh, and in quote, prohibition on gold transactions, in your opinion, if they were to go this route, perhaps also on Bitcoin, would this leave two of our beloved hedges against negative real rates moot? Uh, yes, it could. Uh, I, you would have to, uh, they would have to convince Russia and China and India and actually much of Eurasia to stop stockpiling gold first off. Um, and if they could control Bitcoin, which would likely require significant personal threats of either fines or jail time uh, or violence, um, in my opinion, and as such, at least in the U.S., I hope unlikely. I, so yes is the short answer. The longer answer is is they got to get some the big creditors to play along on gold. I don't think they're going to play along. They've got to threaten Americans with major fines or jail time. I hope they're not going to do that. And so I don't know that they can do a lot about gold or Bitcoin. With that said, it does tie into my prior point about politically acceptable hedges versus politically unacceptable hedges and being diversified. To me, that is 
it's why I'm not a, a, a Bitcoin maxi, if you will. I, it's a, why I can't ascribe to that or recommend that for clients is because I, as long as you can ignore the political history and you think that there's a zero chance that authorities won't do draconian things, uh, then I guess, sure, go ahead, be a Bitcoin maxi. With that said, I think you need to pay attention to what's happened over the last three months. We've seen the mandates. Uh, pay attention to what's happening in Australia and New Zealand. Things are happening that we would have said 12 months ago had zero chance of happening. And so there's a bigger picture potentially happening. And so that's why I think it remains prudent to remain diversified within inflation hedges between politically acceptable equities, real estate, and politically unacceptable, quote unquote, uh, gold, Bitcoin. Uh, from WB, Luke, do you have a strong or even a medium conviction on the direction of the general U.S. stock market over the next two to three months? I do not. Lots of counterbalances both ways, in my opinion. Next two to three months, it, let me back up. Any sort of short-term time horizon, I often don't have a strong feeling one way or another. One of those right now, one of those times is probably not right now. And the reason I, I, I feel that way, I don't have a strong conviction either way, is because it's so political. In other words, right now, it's all about the U.S. government. Are we going to are we going to raise a debt ceiling? Are we going to have a political infighting? Uh, are we going to shut down? I, I have I have no edge on that. And, and so I'm just not comfortable one way or another. With that said, the thing I do have extremely high conviction is when we look out beyond uh, two to three months, four months, five months, six months and beyond, it is absolutely a matter of U.S. national security for the stock market to rise. Uh, the policymakers in the U.S. have allowed the system to evolve in a way that stocks have to rise to support consumer spending, to support GDP and tax receipts. And given our debt position, given how big stocks are, there's simply not the ability uh, for policy to allow stocks to fall 20% and stay down 20%. Could stocks fall 20%? Absolutely. We saw it last March. Will stocks be allowed to stay down 20%? In my view, Absolutely not. And we saw that last March as well. And then last question of the night from CC. Igor Session of Res Rosneft, excuse me, blames energy shortages on years of underinvestment, partly driven by net zero targets. He also predicts that things will get worse. Does this contradict a peak cheap oil theory? Could climate action missteps crash the world economy? Uh, in my opinion, it does not uh, contradict peak cheap oil. Uh, I think net zero, uh, particularly in the West, may actually be code for peak cheap oil. Uh, because if you say climate change and net zero, you sound like a hero. If you come out and say, hey, peak cheap oil or peak oil, uh, the bond market crashes on you and people freak out and act very differently in terms of behavior. So it's um, to me it seems like it could very well be a much more politically acceptable way of getting to the same thing. Let's set that aside and say that's crazy conspiracy theory talk and say that's absolutely not true. Climate change is climate change. Even then, uh, I don't think it discredits peak cheap oil in any way or contradicts it in any way because ultimately you can still see where the marginal sources of supply are likely to have to come from. And almost unanimously, they require higher or significantly higher prices for oil and gas to drive that investment. So I think whether it is... I think ultimately net zero is making things worse, but I don't think it's the reason. I think we're, the real issue is the level of growth and what's happening with geology. Now, could climate action missteps crash the world economy? Yeah, I do. Uh, take a look at what's happening in, in Europe. Take a look at what's happening in the UK. Take a look at what's happening in China. Um, it's all fun and games until there's not gas at the pumps. Uh, it's all fun and games until you've got to shut down your factory because there's no electricity, because there's no gas, so there's no coal. So uh, I admire the peak cheap, or excuse me, the, the net zero and the climate change and what they're trying to do. With that said, um, look, I've got solar panels on my roof, um, but when I put the solar panels on, I didn't connect. I didn't disconnect my natural gas generator. I didn't disconnect my natural gas secondary heat. I didn't disconnect wood-burning stoves I have. I didn't disconnect uh, geothermal HVAC units that I have. I, <laughs> I'm hedged. Um, but I didn't disconnect those. And I can speak from someone with solar panels in Cleveland, Ohio. It'd be really, really cold uh, for a lot of the winter if I was relying on those bad boys for my heat all winter. Uh, so... 
I think it's been very suboptimal planning. I'll be, uh, I'll try to be politically correct here. I think it's been very suboptimal planning. Certainly, uh, can that crash the world economy? Absolutely, uh, because a cold winter for me, if I just have solar panels, is an economy crashing. Um, if that's applied more broadly to an economy. So let's see what happens. Ultimately, I continue to be very bullish on fossil fuels uh, broadly. Uh, and so with that, that's it for the night. As always, thank you for joining me. Uh, as always, if you're interested in learning more about what we're up to, check us out at fftt-llc.com. Uh, can also check out our Tree Rings product, 10 Most Interesting Things Every Week. Great synopsis ties into recent events and things we've been talking about. So until next time, everybody stay safe out there. We will talk with you soon. Take care.